the um, executive director of research compliance in the Office of Research and Technology Management. So thank you again, Kim, for uh, putting this pre presentation together for us. Um, and I know that you had said you directly sort of touched on all the points that uh, we had shared with you that we thought would be great to focus on. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Lowen Townsend and um, the Associate Dean of Research from MSAS and helping coordinate this uh, session and as well as Anna Gibbis from the doctoral program. So thank you both. Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, like Sue said, I was able to, there's probably like, I believe it was 22 bullet points, but I tried to put all those in either, I either had it in a presentation or that I had um, put together for you. And then also I added, um, but if you have any questions, um, please stop me and um, we can discuss um, your question. But um, I'm over, gonna go over research ethics and um, how we actually got to the IRB and federal regulations, um, human research protections, um, and then the IRB board itself. Um, so we'll just briefly go through a history of misconduct and research, and then we'll um, go through the guidelines um, and principles, um, and then the definitions. So there's a lot of words out there, but in the IRB world, a lot, uh, it they mean a different things. And the Office for Human Research Protection is what governs all of the local IRBs. And a lot of their definitions are a lot different than the dictionary words. Um, so uh, I'll go through those. We'll go through the different types of studies, um, especially um, one of the things that we actually see a lot with MSAS is uh, the difference between quality improvement and then research. Um, so we'll, we'll do a deep dive into that. And then um, a brief outline of protocol submissions. And then once the protocol is approved, you know, what happens and what, what's your responsibilities? So as far as the um, history of research misconduct, there unfortunately have been multiple um, scenarios and cases where uh, the scenario is that these individuals were either not told they were going to be in a research study or um, that they were in um, they didn't have a ch uh, the chance to say yes or no, or even were consented. Um, and uh, the big one is um, the public health, um, which was a study that was actually, um, the money came from our federal government and it started in 1932. And um, as we're gonna go through in the slides, 1947 is when we had um, declaration of Helsinki so if you think of 1932, there were no regulations or anything. Um, but so what happened with this study is um, the public health wanted to look at uh, uh, syphilis. So they worked with uh, University of Tuskegee and um, were able to um, go into and um, they um, consented men um, and they basically wanted to look at syphilis from the course of when they um, they had it to um, actually their death. Um, so the it was a pretty secure in 1932 study, but unfortunately um, the, they didn't consent to any of these individuals. And what they basically were saying to these uh, men was that they're being treated for bad blood. And um, back then bad blood for these individuals could be syphilis, it could be anemia, it could mean a lot of different things. And then um, the researcher said that if you, you know, if you let us take your blood and, and follow you um, to, for your disease process, we'll give you free medical exams, free meals, and then free burial insurance because the endpoint was their death. Um, however, in 1940, in the 1940s, um, penicillin was the safe and effective treatment for syphilis. So that's when it became the unethical study um, because none of these men um, were able to receive the penicillin to help them. Um, and what the researchers did, um, and I don't know what their train of thought was, but they basically said that, thought to themselves that if we give these individuals penicillin, there goes our study. Um, so it happened in 1972 when the media um, came about and broadcasted this. 
Um, and what happened was Tus um, the United States government had to give Tuskegee Health uh, Benefit Program, not only to the individual men, but also their families. Um, and um, the common thread, unfortunately, with all of these studies was that the participant did not freely or knowingly even volunteer for research. And potentially if they had, they, they probably would have um, said no to the study. So as we see in 1947 is a Nuremberg Code and then uh, Declaration of Helsinki. And then 1979 is the Belmont Report. And that's basically the backbone and what um, the overall arching um, regulations for the IRBs and the human subject uh, federal regulations. Um, so then as you can see, 1966 is when NIH um, came about. 1981 is where um, the federal regulations for human subject research. Uh, 1986 is the FDA. And then as we well know in 2000 is when HIPAA came up aboard. Um, and then um, the government finally in 2019 revised the common rule. Um, it updated a lot of things, um, especially since it was went into effect in 1981. Um, as far as the historical background, World War II was basically the turning point um, where many guidelines were, were finally developed. Um, and some, um, especially with the World Health Organization, they were um, helped as far as um, guidelines for specific diseases, including HIV and AIDS. Nuremberg Code um, followed, um, and it basically said that the uh, to enroll a study, a human subject in a study, they absolutely it was essential for them to have legal capacity of consent and um, that they basically had a choice um, to say yes or no. And um, the informed consent um, obviously should not be without coercion. Um, also qualified scientists really should have um, and uh, oversee the research and um, that there is no expectation of death or dis disability. Um, Declaration of Helsinki um, was 1964, um, the World Health or, uh, Medical Association, um, and this was basically model um, the Nuremberg Code, and it basically um, even more went more so into the consent process itself. Um, and then um, it was that one was it was actually revised in 1975. And then as far as the Belmont report, um, this is um, basically the uh, a report um, that's probably. A little over 100 pages, um, but it basically goes into three different principles, and the three principles are beneficence, respect for persons, and justice. And then all three of these basically um, fit really nice into human subject research, because as far as respect for persons, that's where the informed consent um, process comes in. Beneficence is we're um, always looking at the uh, benefits and risks, and then also justice, because we want to make sure that um, there is equitable selection of subjects. So the um, common rule, also known as the Federal Regulations for Human Research, um, is composed of Part A. Um, this is basically all the rules and regulations for the IRB to follow, and then also the institution where research is um, being overseen. And then also for researchers. So the part A um, also includes what um, the study team and the PI should be um, as expected to do. And then there's three subparts um, and these are vulnerable populations. So pregnant women, human fetuses and neonates is part B. Um, prisoners is part C and then uh, children is part D. And um, basically the um, changing of the common rule um, there were a couple things that um, helped researchers or actually the burden um, of researchers. So um, there was an expansion of the exempt categories. So some of some of the research that had to go to an IRB member that which fell under expedited review now actually can be um, reviewed administratively. Um, so at Case Western Reserve University, if there's an exempt protocol, we're able to review that um, one of our IRB administrators is able to review and make those determinations. And um, as far as continuing review, so low risk, um, not greater than minimal risk studies um, that are under the expedited review, there's no longer an annual continuing review, um, which is very helpful. 
Um, and then also um, what happened was um, one of the things that with the changes is if there's a study that's federally funded and it's a multi-site and if it's uh, not, if it's a non-exempt study, so if it falls under expedited review or full board, then um, it is mandated that one IRB is IRB of record. And then all of the other sites then will re will rely on that one um, institution's IRB. Okay. Okay, so as far as definitions, uh, research um, is a systematic investigation. So it includes uh, research and development, testing and evaluation. And then it has to be designed to either develop or contribute to generalizable knowledge. And then um, a human subject is a living individual. And then it's either an investigator conducting research can obtain data through intervention or having contact with that person. Or if um, a faculty member or student is getting uh, identifiable or private information. So you may not have any contact with the individual, but maybe from an agency or such, you'll be um, obtaining uh, identifiable data that would then be considered human subject. And risk. So risk is the probability of harm. And this is actually the definition for the Office for Human Research Protections, that um, it's probability of harm or injury occurring as a result of participating in a study. And the risks um, not only are um, physical risks, but it could be psychological. Um, it could potentially be a study um, a survey, and it may be um, different questions on that survey, which may, um, you know, cause someone to to relive something, a traumatic event. Um, so that could potentially be psychological um, areas. And then also social and economical. And then one of the bullet points that, um, that was asked um, by MSAS was that, what is minimal risk? Um, and what the IRB basically, um, and OHRP, um, it's basically daily activities of daily living and that, um, not greater than minimal risk is basically those ordinary daily living um, that you perform. And so that if you're enrolling in a study, um, either routine physical or psychological examinations or tests, um, that if it's not, if it's basically, you know, getting out of bed, eating breakfast, um, driving to work, <laughs> um, work, you know, your work um, conditions, um, if it's if the research activities equal that, then it's um, not greater than minimal risk. If they do, then um, that's sort of the curve. Um, the Institutional Review Board, um, it's an independent group. Um, what we do is we have, um, what the mandate is for OHRP is five members. Um, however, we have um, more than that. We actually have faculty members from across the university. Um, the um, MSAS representatives is Dr. Crampton and then um, Dr. Fisher. Um, so we do have representations from MSAS. Um, and then we also have representation for any protocol that the IRB has to review. Um, we want to make sure that we have faculty members that, you know, are are accustomed to that research or that's their area of expertise um, so that it's a thorough review. And then another mandate that OHRP make um, mandates all IRBs is we have to have a non-scientist. And then we also have to have someone from that is not affiliated with the university. So someone that um, doesn't have any association with a uh, business relationship um, employment with Case Western Reserve University. And then that way, when they're reviewing protocols, they're sort of looking at the uh, society and um, the community and um, looking at research that way. So it's a non-judgmental -judge and um, it's really um, important. Um, and they really have a voice um, on our IRB when we're reviewing protocols. Um, so the IRB's purpose and responsibilities is basically to protect human subjects. So they're making sure that there's ethical conduct of the research um, and then making sure that um, the institutional compliance with regulatory agencies um, is um, across the board. And then they're looking, they um, actually have a lot of checklists and um, they're always making sure that there's a decrease in risk and increase in benefit. 
And then um, they're looking at the data safety monitoring, um, informed consent process. And then if there is a uh, vulnerable populations, there's additional um, information that they do need to review um, to make sure that um, like children being uh, enrolled in studies, that you know the parents are being asked first before the, the child, and then the, the child does have a say so, even if the parent does say yes. Um, as far as going back to uh, the Belmont report, when looking at beneficence, it's minimizing the benefits and, um, or I'm sorry, maximizing the benefits and minimizing the harm. So, and then also looking at good methodology and um, looking to see if there's any um, help in yielding benefits to society. I know, um, I know your school works a lot with agencies and um, it helps society and helps those agencies. So, um, that's another um, method that we do um, review when we're looking at protocols. And then um, we're making sure that they're consistent with sound research um, and that um, procedures that are um, potentially being performed on the subjects um, for treatment purposes, um, we're, we're sort of um, sifting out like what is um, maybe potentially a program you know, if someone's going to be in a program, no matter if they say yes or no to research, and really the only part of what the research is, is obtaining that information or additional information from these subjects, we're sort of parsing out in the consent form of what the research is versus what the program would be. Um, as far as justice, it's moral requirements, so it's fair and equitable um, selection of research participants, and then um, we're always looking at who is likely to benefit from those outcomes and making sure that they're included in the um, population. And then um, looking to make sure that um, there's equal um, administration and non-exploitative uh, or well-considered procedures to potential research participants, which means that just moral requirements and fair procedures. So we're making sure that um, one population potentially would um, be overburdened, or um, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen, or that another um, population could potentially have uh, additional benefits. Um, and as far as benefits, we're making sure that whoever is likely to benefit from these outcomes are, um, are, are able to even be approached to be in a study. Um, so equitable selection doesn't mean that all groups are um, represented in proportion to the population, um, but we're making sure that no group is unduly burdened or will unfairly benefit from the research. And then equitable selection, not only is, um, you know, you think of age or um, economic standing, um, but it also could be um, gender, language, or literacy. So if, um, if there's a literate person um, and that they could potentially benefit from the research, um, that there's extra uh, steps put into the study um, so that these individuals could be um, basically uh, enrolled in the study if they so wish um, to be enrolled. And then the last um, is for the uh, Belmont report is respect for persons. So we're making sure that um, subjects are um, individual autonomy um, and that there's always protection of them and um, their decision-making to make sure that, um, it, you know, do they understand what the study is? And then if they do want to or not, um, do not want to uh, enroll. And then there's three considerations. So we're looking at the autonomy of the patient or um, participant. And then we're looking at if they have diminished autonomy, um, such as mental health disorders, um, we're making sure that there's additional protections for them. And then being truthful and um, uh, to conduct no uh, deception. So the consent form has to be transparent. And then the informed consent process itself is basically um, giving uh, knowledgeable decision making and voluntary participation. So that's another um, what the informed consent process is um, overall arching purpose. And then the consent process itself, um, just making sure that there's adequate information. Um, if, if someone doesn't want to participate in a study, if there's other options that they have, 
and then um, responding to all of their questions um, to make sure that they um, understand the study. And then another um, with the revised common rule is um, OHRP now has put in this key information section for the informed consent form. What they're um, basically, their train of thought for this is um, they feel that these five elements, um, if they're put into the, the very beginning of a consent form, it basically will give someone the amount of information that they uh, potentially could understand the study. And then if they would, would or would not want to participate. And then as they're reading, then they go into the eight elements. So then there's additional information that goes into uh, more information for them about the study. Um, so these are the eight um, elements. And then there's additional information um, if, it, if it's applicable. Um, and a lot of people will say, um, you know, if it's a multi-site study, um, there's a lot of times where they'll put the number of participants at the site versus the overall study. And then um, I brought, I pulled this out right out of our, um, the consent form template um, because um, a lot of people were asking about compensation. So um, first of all, the compensation we wanted to, if there's any cost to the participant for being enrolled in the study, we wanna make sure that that's brought out. Um, and then if they're not gonna be compensated to make sure that they're, that's also um, in the consent form. And then, um, if they are going to be compensated, we think of compensation as basically of their time, um, and potentially if um, you know if they're coming into case um, and coming to one of um, our labs here, um, we want to make sure that um, if they have to park, that you know that they're just being reimbursed for that. Um, so it's basically spelling out for them that you know you'll receive um, this amount of money or a gift card and then basically um, why they're receiving it. And then also if it's a multi-visits, um, multi we wanna make sure that how much are they gonna receive for each visit? And then also that um, if they decide to withdraw from the study, we wanna make sure that they know that they'll be paid for the visits that they completed. But if, you know, let's say if it's a five visits and each time they come, it's $20, we want to make sure that they don't um, think in their minds that they're going to get a hundred dollars, no matter if you know if they're only only going to go to two or three sessions. That really to get that hundred dollars, they have to go all five. Um, the informed consent document itself, um, it's um, basically making sure lay terms, um, and then making sure if the subject doesn't speak English, that it's in their native language. Um, there's an interpreter um, to help them. And then um, if someone is cognitively impaired, we want to make sure um, they if they have a legally authorized representative, that that person is, um, is pulled in to basically that is a person that would um, have to say yes or no for that um, cognitively impaired person to be enrolled in a study. Um, the recommendation right now is eighth grade level. However, depending on your patient population, you may have to go a bit, little bit lower. Um, and just um, as far as the consent form, we recommend the second person and just using an active voice throughout the consent form. Um, they're also in Word, um, if you don't know already, um, there's a couple readability um, programs that you um, can sort of flush out your words and um, put them into uh, eighth grade level or even lower. Um, and then just making it simple. Um, here's a great example that, you know, if, if you're um, at one of the agencies and there it's, let's like, say, a drug treatment center um, and that you're um, going and you're asking the person if they that you want to study the investi uh, to investigate the cognitive or behavioral influences on medica medication adherence, they probably will not understand what you're even saying after the first five words. Um, so it's really better to say that and what you're really wanting is to see how they take their, uh, how they manage their illness and how they take their medicine. Um, so just making sure it's simple. And then, um, you know, you have the consent form, um, which is, you know, the words on your paper, um, but you can use pictures or graphics. Um, a lot of people that, um, if it's a multi-site, um, multi, -site, um, multi um, visits um, and it's different things that are going to happen at each visit. Uh, a lot of people will 
we'll um, put tables together um, just to sort of to spell out for the uh, participants. And then also um, in uh, putting this presentation together, um, I found that 65% of populations are actually visual learners, um, which I thought was interesting. Um, so just uh, making it appealing for the participants, um, you know, just helping them understand your study. And then um, as far as the informed consent, um, it may be waived altogether with the IRB permission. Um, and basically um, one of the reasons, it, justifications for this would be, uh, you know, if you're enrolling people into a study and the only thing that is going to, um, especially if it's maybe like a drug treatment center, and the only thing that you're doing is you're, um, you're potentially giving them surveys. So really the only um, thing that would link a person to their study or their survey would be their, the consent form that potentially could be a waiver um, for the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the signature of the consent. Um, and then um, making sure that if you have um, any conflict of interest, that that's actually put into the consent form also. Um, so one simply doesn't receive IRB approval, unfortunately, <laughs> but fortunately, because um, the IRB really does need to look at everything, um, consent form and all of the documents that you do upload in the um, your protocol to um, make sure that um, everything is within the regulations. So as far as privacy, um, I always think of privacy as, as a person um, or their, uh, the physical surroundings. So um, making sure that you're giving them the privacy when you are consenting them. So making sure that um, it's in a private setting versus a public waiting room, let's say, and that um, the person that um, even, you know, filling out a questionnaire that they could potentially have um, the capacity to um, be at home or whatever location they want to um, complete the questionnaire. And then confidentiality, um, I always think of as data um, and we're making sure that the data is um, is observed by the study personnel, like especially the identifiable data, um, and then it's protected. So it's coded, it's password protected, um, it's on a server, a secure server, and then um, if there's paper, it's a locked file cabinet. As far as vulnerable population, um, as we mentioned before, um, it's pregnant women, prisoners, and children. Um, but then it's also decisionally impaired individuals. And then um, faculty members, university students, and employees here at CASE, um, we, if there's another individual who is um, wanting to recruit you for a study, um, we actually are all vulnerable populations. Um, so we make sure that if a faculty member wants to recruit their own students, that there's um, mechanisms put in place so that there's no perception of coercion and making sure that there's um, a third party person um, that will go and consent these individuals. And then um, if for your study, if you want, if you need identifiable data, we make sure that um, the faculty member doesn't get that data until the grades are in. Um, we wanna make sure that, you know, students are thinking that if they don't, participate in your study that it will affect their, uh, their grades in the, in the class. Um, and then just making sure that um, there's a additional regulations, um, but then also protections um, for, um, for um, any of the vulnerable population. Um, as far as types of research, um, it's important to um, uh, apply for IRB approval. Um, there was a question on the um, the list was um, as far as when to uh, apply for approval, um, but it needs to be done before conducting any human subject research. Um, and also as far as applying for funding, um, what we, you know, as far as funding, there's a lot of um, applications that go in that are, are unfortunately not funded. So if you're not going to be able to do your study, um, if you're not funded, what we do is if you get a good score, we really recommend at that point to put your IRB protocol through. Because um, if you get a good score, chances are 
high for you to um, get um, to get that grant or um, funding. Um, and then as far as students um, working with their faculty members, um, if it's a dissertation and you need to um, make sure that everyone signs off on what research you are going to do, it's important to do that first. And then when you have that, um, the finalized version, then apply for the IRB. Um, then what happens um, if research, there was another one, is, is conducted without IRB approval? Um, as far as federal regulations, um, the um, if you do conduct human subject research without IRB approval, um, OHRP deems it to be serious noncompliance. Um, so what would happen then is um, the IRB would then have to determine, and the IRB does determine if a serious or continuing um, noncompliance um, is basically what would happen um, if you can use the research um, data that you have collected. And more than not, what the IRB is going to do is make sure that you're reconsenting these individuals um, to make sure that you do have IRB approval first. Um, as far as um, the impact of conducting uh, research, um, what um, the Case Western Reserve University has done is um, federally funded studies um, is reportable to the Office for Human Research Protection and then also the federal funding agency. Um, and then also if your research is funded, let's say by an agency, um, we would have to actually look into that contract to make sure that, um, and more than not, the if there's serious or continuing noncompliance, usually the agency will want to know. So then we would have to report that um, to the agency or whoever is funding the research. Um, so as far as um, who, um, if you're unsure, um, please contact our, uh, our office. We do a lot of consultation. So um, there we also, we have a um, IR, uh, email, which is um, case-irb uh, at case.edu. And then um, th as far as the emails, each one of us has, uh, for the five days, we, each one of us has an email day for this, this um, email address. So we do try to, within 24 hours, um, respond to the emails that we do get. And then um, our IRB website is also um, a great place for all of our contact information. So if there's an IRB administrator you would like to talk to, um, you have you can get the contact information there. Okay, so not human subject research. So mo more than not, it's not intended to produce generalizable knowledge. Um, uh, and so we're looking at not involving either living individuals or the research is publicly available. Um, and then I'm gonna go into quality improvement or program evaluation too. Um, so as far as exempt, so re exempt is research. So it would be to produce generalizable knowledge, um, but it, it's a low risk um, like surveys. And then if the, uh, individuals are um, identifiable, um, then it basically has to be um, questions that potentially like surveys um, that potentially are um, not going to either um, economically or psychologically um, do any damage to that person. Um, for the exempt, um, the expansion of the exempt categories, we now are able to, um, if it is, you know, identifiable private information that you're obtaining, um, we're able to put it into limited review, which means that the IRB administrator is reviewing and determining this. But what happens is if we send it to, in fact, we have one of our UTEC um, folks on our IRB board. So we actually will send it to him or, or potentially an IRB member. But what they do is they only look at the data protection and making sure how, how you're getting the data, how you're storing it, and then if you are if you are transferring it, but that's all they're looking at is the data. Um, and that could be under the exempt category. And then um, benign behavioral intervention, um, that now is under exempt. Um, and one of the, um, basically it's, it, it's a short um, 
you're looking at someone and um, doing an activity and it has to be short in nature. So potentially if you um, wanna see what happens, let's say of, of people putting a puzzle together, you may have them listening to different types of music, um, either classical music, if that um, changes um, the way that they could put a puzzle together versus let's say rock music, um, if it, it has an effect on the way that they're putting the puzzle together. Um, as far as expedited review category, um, this is still um, less than minimal risk, um, but it's um, it's either a non-invasive procedure, um, and this then goes to one of the IRB members for them to review. And then if it's greater than minimal risk, or if it doesn't fit in the, any of the expedited categories, that's when it goes to the full board. And then there's another caveat where if an IRB member is reviewing a protocol, let's say under the expedited review category, but they feel that they that um, the board itself should have a conversation um, with, with regard to that study, they can always um, contact our office and um, then the full board would look at those protocols. So NIH has expanded their definition for a clinical trial um, so clinical trials are um, basically prospectively assigned um, to one or more interventions and to evaluate those interventions of health-related either biomedical or behavioral outcomes. So we're seeing a lot of, um, of be, uh, behavioral outcome studies that now have to um, be registered with clinicaltrials.gov. Um, looking at research versus quality improvement versus case studies, it's very murky um, because as you can see, research is a systematic collection of data um, per, for the purpose of ge that generalizable knowledge, but quality improvement is a systematic collection for data for the uh, purpose of improving performance of one specific entity. So if we think about quality improvement or program evaluation, what we're thinking is if it's gonna fall under not human subject research, is that that information is going to stay with that one agency. So if you're looking at a program um, and um, seeing if it, if whatever they're doing and that's all you're doing is, and then that's information is going to stay within that agency, then it would not, it would be, it would could be considered not human subject research. Um, as in the case of um, case studies, if you have one or two de-identified cases, um, that in itself um, doesn't, rise to the level of generalizable knowledge. Uh, and one thing that um, CASE has done is that research um, requires a determination by the IRB. Um, so if you're unsure, please contact us um, and we'll work with you um, to, to see where, where your project falls. Um, so it's important just to see what you're trying to accomplish and then how will you know that a change is an improvement um, and what changes could result in that improvement. Um, that, so that sort of helps you um, establish um, your, if, you have, if it's gonna be research and what hypothesis you have um, that you're trying to, um, to, to review. Um, here is a Deming um, uh, PDSA model for, um, this is basically for um, quality improvements. Um, and it's basically the plan, do, study, act, and this would then follow under not human subject research. And then um, as far as medical records or obtaining um, pro uh, protected health information, um, even from an agency that treats um, individuals and it's um, if they're treating them and diagnosing them and it falls under pro uh, protected health information, um, and you're obtaining information from the, these um, charts or electronic medical records, the IRB um, needs to waive informed consent. Um, and the reason why they're gonna waive it is um, if you're looking at, let's say a chart and you're looking to see if, um, if someone is on a specific um, medicine um, or a different program that they're under, you don't really know who you're gonna be recruiting. Um, so there's no problem. There's not a practical um, way that you could even consent to any of these individuals. 
And then um, for HIPAA, um, we would, uh, the IRB then would waive um, the HIPAA authorization. So you can look at the uh, electronic medical records. Um, for secondary data analysis, if you're re reviewing existing data for a specific person, um, also if it's de-identified, <laughs> please consult the IRB office. Um, there's different scenarios where de-identified data could be not human subject research, um, but it it um, sometimes funding, um, especially if you're a, a principal investigator on the, um, let's say a federal grant, even if it's de-identified data, um, the IRB may have to review the protocol, um, the whole um, grant that um, itself, because of you being the PI, you're responsible for um, everything that's being conducted in the grant. As far as um, uh, students um, getting information from um, their faculty member um, for their dissertation, um, it, it would be recommended that you consult our IRB office. Um, we wanna make sure that um, if it's, especially if it's a different project, um, the, what has happened now with the revised common rule is um, the OHRP is pretty, um, they're more strict of the information. So like the consent forms have to say in them that they, the data could be shared um, with that project itself, or they potentially have to, the consent form has to say that they can, you, the data could be shared um, for other projects. Um, and a lot of in, uh, consent forms now actually have check boxes. So really those individuals that would say that you could share information on other projects and those are the information that could be shared with the students. Um, but we would then work with, um, with the student and the faculty member um, to help you with this. Um, what is the difference between um, these four um, areas of data? Anonymous is basically, um, if you think about a survey or questionnaire and you're not getting the IP address um, and you're getting the, the through Qualtrics um, and you don't know who the individual is. These are, it's strict, it's anonymous. Um, if you, there's no way that you could um, figure out who these people are. As far as de-identified, um, at one point there was, this was identifiable data but all of the markers um, of identifiable um, is, is stripped from those that data. Um, identifiable would be that you know who the, the person is, um, that um, there's some type of um, markers um, that would identify. And then restricted. Um, restricted would be um, potentially HIPAA um, and um, other information. So we would want to make sure that all of this is on um, one of our secure servers um, and um, like the child study um, that Dr. Fisher has um, and Dr. Colton had, um, you know, they're basically getting information from children from and collecting data. And um, so that is actually on a ser secure server and uh, would be considered restricted data um, to make sure that it's protected. Um, as far as remote data collection, we want to make sure that um, the protocol should describe how you're collecting data. Um, and basically we're making sure that um, if it's a remote platform, um, UTEC um, is um, the best um, in their website um, to help you as far as remote platforms to ensure that there's privacy and data security. And um, actually Cal Fry is on our, from UTEC is on our IRB. So he helps a lot with the security plans. Um, for your IRB protocols. So he's a great so resource. Um, for surveys, Qualtrics and REDCap um, are really great um, recommendations for those. And then if you're doing interviews, um, Zoom or even phone, if, you're, um, if you don't wanna do the interviews in person or for whatever reason, you can't, um, you can't. As far as uh, recordings, yes, they are all identifiable. So audio recordings, because you have the voice, um, even if, it, if, if you have it on your computer with you know, the A16, um, that person's voice is still on there. And then as far as video recordings, obviously the person um, voice and um, 
um, their them themselves are there. And then also the same with the Zoom recordings. And then what the IRB recommends is if you can or when you can um, translate these, um, it's best to do that. And then once you have your translation and you have every everything you need then um, to destroy the recordings. And then as far as data storage, um, privacy and confidentiality um, is great. Um, what we recommend is that um, we make sure that um, personal computers aren't used, that let's that box is used um, or another um, entity. And then you can use your, um, these students could use their personal computer um, to access box if they're at home or other locations um, because you can VPN. Um, for data storage, um, REDCap and Box are HIPAA compliant. And then um, making sure that um, no uh, storage of private information should be on any um, individual person's um, computers. And then, um, as I mentioned, Box is VPN access. So far as um, submission guidelines, um, requests for, so the SPART IRB is what's used. Um, so you want to make sure that you're asking to, um, for an account to be created and just uh, allowing enough time. Um, you can prepare your protocol. And what we've done is now it's a protocol template that you would pull off of our um, the SPART IRB system. Um, you write up the informed consent form. That also, we have a template. And then um, obtaining any necessary approvals or support letters. So if you're doing a research, let's say at an agency, you want a letter of support that that agency is allowing you to do research there. And then once you get your SPART RAB account, then you use your case ID and password. And that's how you get into our system. All right. So as far as submitting protocols, you access the SPARTA IRB. Um, you complete the SMART form, which is basically the backbone of the study. You choose the protocol, you upload that. And then um, once you have everything on, into your protocol, it requires a chair or departmental sign-off. Um, so actually Sue Ambro is the sign-off for MSAS. Um, so that would be sent to her. Once Sue signs off on that, then the principal investigator of the study then will send it to the IRB so that we can review and approve it for you. So here's the um, SPARTA IRB system. This is what the login page looks like. And then um, as far as um, looking at um, the library or health center are great resources um, because um, when you click under um, the library, you're going to come up with templates. And those are all the consent forms and then um, templates. And then also what type of research you're doing is the template um, for the protocol that you're going to pick. Um, the PI cannot be a student or resident. It has to be a faculty member. And then uploading documents in the correct section. So we have a protocol section. We have a consent um section and then we have um, other documents section and then that's where you would put your questionnaire or um, whatever um, methods you're using your uh, if you have any letters of support and then um, just stacking your documents so if you have any changes of the document there's an update button um, next to it where you would click it and then upload your um, the, the second version, let's say, of your of the of the document. Um, so here's just basically um, information. Um, this is the the smart form um, of the title of the study, and it just asks you different um, questions. And then um, this is a section where you would attach your protocol. So you would just click the add button and then um, put your protocol there. And then there's a section for consent forms. And then recruitment materials, um, that's where um, you would put any, um, let's, if you're, let's say you're going to um, advertise in the daily, um, you would upload that, whatever you're going to um, advertise there, social media advertisements, wherever you're going to um, advertise. And then um, other attachments, um, as I said, that's where you would put the other documents that don't fit in the other sections. And then um, 
once you um, put your protocol there, um, it, it's uh, under the attached to protocol. And then there was a question about CREC. Um, so CREC, um, once some, a person comes to Case Western Reserve University, um, you take the basic course and you're then put into the CREC program. And then your CREC certificate is good for three years. And then what happens is um, you can go, I have the, in fact, we just, up, we have a soft launch of our website. So all of our, um, our um, web addresses have changed. So, but I've updated it. So this is the correct one, um, but you can go to here and you can, um, there's different areas where you can um, each year, or I'm sorry, every three years, you have to get 12 correct credits. Um, so in order to do track, correct credits. Um, in fact, if um, you send me the list of people who are on this um, this call or who will actually even see this presentation, um, what I can do is I will um, send this presentation to the CREC office and everyone can get CREC credits for um, being um, for this presentation. Um, so this is one of the things is live presentations. Um, there's also city, um, which is where you do the basic course. There's other um, thing, other um, courses you can take for the CREC credits. And then there's also quizzes um, and um, other areas where, so basically just to get the 12 CREC credits. And then um, as far as financial conflict of interest, all of the faculty members have to have a conflict of interest. Um, as far as research, um, we've actually modified um, who has to have a conflict of interest disclosure on file. So if it's federally or um, out external funded, then everyone on the team would have to. Um, if it's not federally uh, funded or not funded, then only the faculty members um, on that study would be um, would have to have correct um, the COI um, disclosure on file. Um, who else can help with the IRB process? Um, if you receive clarifications from the IRB, um, just making sure that um, not to send it back unless, unless all the changes are done. Um, this then helps you um, as far as getting your, your protocol through our system and approved. If you're not sure, you can actually contact the IRB administrator. Um, it's right on the protocol itself who is re overseeing your, your study. And um, I'll just to um, make sure everyone knows, but all members of the study team have to be correct credit, uh, correct certified. And then I, as I said, we have a limitation now of who has to have the COI disclosure. Um, once your protocol is approved, now what? Um, basically, we're um, anything that is um, changing, we want to make sure that you are sending it to the IRB for that change to be um, reviewed and approved by the IRB before it's implemented. And then the same with um, continuing reviews. Um, if it's a full board or special expedited review protocols, um, that's another way that you would um, also um, submit to the IRB. And then um, there's adverse events, unanticipated problems, and protocol deviations. And within those, um, a protocol deviation is altering any aspect of the study itself um, or the protocol um, and changing um, that this would then have to be reported to the IRB. If it's an unexpected problem, that's also needs to be reported. So let's say losing your computer file of um, information that's identifiable. Um, and what happens is it's reportable new information form. So it's right on your protocol. There's a, on the left-hand side, um, it, there's an RNI that you can click for the protocol itself. And you submit this via the Sparta IRB system. And um, the method is um, how the PI and um, this is how you would notify. And the PI doesn't have to be the person who submits this, anyone on the study team actually can submit the RNI. And then um, there's a section where you would then document which protocol this, the RNI is uh, affiliated with. Um, as far as cust uh, custody of research data, this is found in the faculty handbook, um, but the PI is actually, uh, the faculty member is responsible and um, responsibility rights are um, 
concerning access to use of or maintenance of research data and um, making sure that um, not only the maintenance of it, but then the retention of it. And research shall be archived for not less than three years after the final grant closeout or after the last publication resulting from the project. So whichever occurs last. And then the original data should be retained whenever possible. Um, participants who agree to be contacted in the, to the future and uh, future studies, um, this contact information should be separate from their study data. So you're fine to keep that information if that person said, yes, you can contact me. Um, that would then not be affiliated with um, the study that um, potentially if you want to close it. Um, once identified data um, is not linked to um, identifiable uh, participants, then the, the protocol can be closed. And then um, great uh, UTech is actually a great resource to help you um, as far as destroying your data. Um, and here's actually CalFry's contact information. Um, and then here is another um, from the, this is actually from the um, faculty handbook also, as far as student research studies. Um, the in case of the in the case of a student researcher, the PI um, should always have the original data, um, except um, if the original data. Um, so as far as the informed consent form, so if the graduate student wants to take in, uh, the data with them, they really should take a they can take a copy of it, um, as long as um, it's usually there's a written agreement. Um, for the PI and associate vice president for research or their designee, um, or agreeing to accept um, custodial responsibility of the data. And then CASE will be given um, access to the data should that become necessary. Um, so we always want to make sure that um, the faculty member and the graduate student are both protected, especially if there's a publication. Um, so in summary, um, IRB functions are mandatory. Um, I want to say that our IRB office is a great resource and we try to do as many consultations as we can to help you prepare for your protocol or if there's any, let's say, a re a reportable new information. Um, students should work with their advisors and then um, always ask if you're unsure. And then as far as guidance and collaborations, um, it's been really interesting because um, as I'm saying, all these different definitions and regulations, there's some areas where OHRP and NIH do not match um, and the FDA. So they've been telling us for years that they're working together and they're gonna try to um, harmonize their um, processes and their vocabulary. So, however, um, about two weeks ago, we did get an email um, and they are working on this. So there's hope. And then um, also under o uh, OHRP, there's um, SACHARP, which is the Secretary Advisory Committee. And these folks meet quarterly. And what they do is they look at different areas and they come up with different guidance documents, um, which really help the IRB and also researchers. And then um, especially with now NIH having their data sharing policy, um, we're trying to, we're continuing to get guidance on this too, to make sure that we are meeting all of the, the requirements. So if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, um, I'm happy to take them. And here's my contact information um, if you should want to contact me. Sue, so are you going to, um, you want to manage the questions if there are any at this time? Um, I don't see any in the chat. So. It was a lot of information. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> It was You're a lot of information. <laughs> um, so it is, but I will, you know, just reinforce the fact that, you know, you guys are a great resource and very accessible. So we appreciate you always, you know, being there. If people do have questions or, you know, have questions after this presentation, 
Um, right. And, and then we just we agreed Sue to let us <clears throat> use this uh, recording as well on our uh, research and training website. So if people want to go back and look at any of it again, yep, that'd be wonderful. And um, would you be willing to share the handouts with us too? Yes, I will send um, okay. my, the PowerPoint. Yep, definitely, especially with all of the um, information and the links. So, and just also to let you know too, um, the Office of Research and Administration, especially under um, Dr. Oak's leadership, um, we're really trying to, you know, help you, help faculty members and students, um, especially faculty faculty members with all of your administrative burden um, in you know, we're expanding our offices. Um, in fact, I just, um, I've been um, asking for another person at the IRB and I was able to um, hire someone. In fact, they are starting on Monday. I'm happy to report. Mm -hmm. um, but even, um, you know, working with Tech Transfer, our office works, you know, hand in hand with them have, um, um, actually we have every other week we have meetings with them. So for material transfer agreements, and then also now the, the DUA office um, too. Um, so um, I'm hoping that you're seeing the people that um, you know are transferring data to the university or transferring it out, that you're seeing um, you know decrease in the amount of time a DUA is. Um, and they, um, they actually work hand in hand with our office too, because they always wanna make sure that there's IRB approval or there, there's a, a not human subject research um, stamp there. Um, and that's another thing we've done is um, we've always had to have um, documentation for us to say yes or no, especially if it's not human subject research. But we have a, we've worked with D, the DUA office, so now there's a in in um, a form that you um, fill out, and then within that form, that's the documentation. So then that way you you wouldn't have to put a protocol through um, our our system. And Kim, thank you for offering uh, correct credit for participating. Yes. Yep. I've been trying to do that to, um, you know, just to this, you're, you're learning about research, <laughs> human subject research. So um, that's all, all, what the correct program is about. And I was able to write everyone down so I can follow up with the list. I'll send you the list. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Attendance. And had, I think I had heard through the grapevine perhaps, but I'm not sure if, um, will there be an update to the IRB Sparta system? Or is that coming anytime soon or? Yes, we're hoping um, that we're gonna get an upgrade to our system. Um, they've been busy with um, grant the pre-award pre for grants. Mm -hmm. And then um, the conflict of interest now is in the Sparta system. So that was a big um, project. So, um, I think we're we're very near um, the next project that they're going to take on, and we'll work hand in hand with them. Sounds good. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. All right. Well, thanks right. again, Kim. You're welcome. I really appreciate um, such Thank a thorough you. presentation, and it's always good to see you. Nice to see you. Have a great weekend. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye.